Hello, my name is Mark. Today we're going to be looking at the Higher Level 2022 Physics paper, and particularly looking at question four, which in this case is a question on um, waves. It's an experiment question. So yeah, let's get straight into it. So question four in this case is going to be a question on waves, as I was saying, and it's going to be talking about um, the speed of sound in air, and we're going to be doing an experiment question relating to this. So having a look at part I here, we're going to be asked to draw a label diagram of how the apparatus was arranged in this experiment. And here we have our labeled diagram. So there's a lot going on here. So let's just take a moment to label everything in it. First thing to note is we're going to have our ruler over here on the left hand side. And that's going to be used for um, uh, measuring kind of the gap and, you know, the depth of the um, tube inside of the, the resonance tube. Um, as well as that, we're going to have a tuning fork here as well, which is going to be um, on top of the apparatus. And we have a clamping system, which is going to be on the left hand side. And that clamping system is actually going to go ahead and hold um, a tube, which is, as I was saying, our um, resonance tube. And the important thing to know here is that you need to just include a few buzz terms. Um, the main ones here being a tube and tuning fork. And um, aside from that, you just need a few different kind of ways to measure and um, measure length and as well as that changing the actual length itself. So the length of the resonance tube. Um, so the way that I've done that is by having a clamping system, so you can raise it lower, and also a ruler, which allows you to measure that length. Um, but yeah, these are the important terms you need to include to get you your full marks. And for including these terms, you're going to get a total of 12 marks, and the breakdown goes as follows. For each of these individually, you're going to get three marks. So you get three marks for saying, um, in this case, a ruler, which was just kind of the means of changing or measuring the length. Uh, you get three marks for uh, saying a tuning fork. You get three marks for giving a, a way of changing that length, so by raising or lowering using a clamp. And then you get another three marks for including your tube. So having a look now at part two, what we're going to be asked to do is to explain how did the student actually determine the length of the air column for a particular frequency? And in this case, the required solution here is that the student's actually going to first actually strike the tuning fork and hold it over the pipe. So that's like the first thing that they're going to do. They're going to hold this vibrating tuning fork um, over the mouth of the pipe. And then what they're going to do is they're going to change the length by adjusting the clamp. So what's going to happen here is the length of the pipe um, should be changed using this uh, method. So changing the, the um, adjusting the clamp, should I say. And what's going to come around as a result of this is going to be a change in like kind of the loudness of the sound. And what they're going to be looking for here is the loudest sound um, heard, which is the important thing to uh, take because that's going to be the point where resonance is occurring. Um, and on, then on top of that, what's going to happen then is that actually that length is going to be then measured from the open end um, to the closed end of the pipe. And it's going to give you um, that length, which is going to be done by uh, using a, a ruler in this case. So this is going to be the kind of method and the system that you need to do uh, and need to follow in order to get your um, full marks for this question, but also in order to kind of um, determine that frequency. So there's going to be a total of six marks going, and I've kind of gone a little bit overboard here explaining what's going on here. I just like to include a lot of information um, so the examiner knows what you're talking about, but you really only need to include um, kind of two of, two of any of these um any two of these to get you your full mark. So, so the first one here could be very simple as just holding the tuning fork over the mouth of the pipe. That's going to get you your three marks. Um, and then, you know, the second one you could have is that you need to change uh, and adjust the length of the pipes. So that could be your other three marks. And um, similarly, you could also mention the fact that if you're doing this until the loudest sound is heard, that's another three marks. You could do that way. Or you could also mention, as we said at the end here, you're looking for, you're then going to measure the, um, the length from the closed end to the open end of the pipe. And that's another way of getting another kind of buzz uh, term that you need to include. But either way, including any of these, any two of these four that I've written down here, will get you each three marks. So um, together, it'll get you a total of six. So having a look now at part three here, what we're going to be seeing, or should I say what we're going to be asked to do, is to draw a graph to show the relationship between L and 1 over F. And then we're given a little note here that says um, the line of best fit should not go through the origin. So that's an important thing to note here. Don't try and force it to if it doesn't, because in this case, we're being told that it doesn't. And um, that's all OK. So the first thing we're going to be doing here is we're going to need to find our values for L and 1 over F, which means that we're going to need to take the values that we have for frequency and find the reciprocal of them. And I'm going to do that in a table. And what I'm going to go ahead and do now is fill in our lengths in centimeters, which are given to us in the question. So now I have gone and plotted, or should I say, drawn out all of our values for our lengths here, what we can now do is look at our values for one over our frequency or the reciprocal of frequency. So basically for one over frequency, what we're going to do is take every value we have for our frequency and just get one over. So the first value that we're going to get here for frequency, and I'll just do this as an example, is going to be 256 hertz. So what we're going to do here is take 1 over 256. And if you plug this into your calculator, what you'll find that the answer is going to be 0 0.00. 
three nine. And what we're going to do here is write that into our table. Now it's completely fine um, to uh, you're going to have like this long decimal expansion. Now you can also kind of do this in terms of scientific notation, and you can actually make it a little easier and neater to write, which is what I'm going to be doing in the graph portion next. But what I'm going to do is just write them out in full here now, and I'm just going to do this for each of the frequencies. So what I've just gone and done is fill in our table here. Now, I know it might be a little bit awkward to kind of look at them because there's a lot of zeros here, and that's completely fine. Um, I've just written them or wrote them down like this, so it's a little bit easier for me to understand the important information, which is going to be these digits here, the significant digits, um, uh, which is going to be, for example, 39 or 35 in these important terms. But um, either way, now that we have got our table correct and nicely filled up, we can go ahead and start plotting our graph. So to start with, what we're going to be doing here is plotting our length versus 1 over f. So I just have a small table, or should I say a small graph here with no points on it. And we're just going to take you through the important things that you need to remember. The first thing is you need to include your units. So our length here is measured in centimeters, so include that. And our frequency here is going to be measured in uh, hertz. So if we get in the reciprocal of it, we're going to have hertz here to the minus 1. Now, another important thing to do or to note, and this is something I'm going to be doing just to make your graphs a little bit neater in future, is we're going to factor out a uh, number like uh, by 10 to the minus four. I'll give you an example of why we're doing that. Now, if we take a look at one of the values we have for our frequency, the, or one of our frequencies, should I say, the first value that we actually had there was that uh, we had 1 over 256, which is going to equal to 0 0.0039, which is very messy, very long, um, and it's going to be quite difficult to draw this on a graph because you're going to have like loads and loads of zeros, so we don't really want that. What we can do is actually rearrange this using scientific notation and write it as 39 by 10 to the minus 4. And these two things here, they're actually going to be, I'll just draw a little arrow here to symbolize it, they're actually the same, they're actually the same uh, number. All I'm doing here is rewriting it in terms of um, the 39 to make it a little bit easier to see the important information here. So we don't really want to have all those zeros, we're just going to condense it down into this. And it means that we're going to include this little by 10 to the minus 4 down here on our um down here on our table, just or, or the um, axis, should I say, of the graph, and that just makes it a little bit easier when we're writing out and plotting our points. So going ahead and plotting our points here, what we're going to have is all of these points kind of forming a nice line here, and what I'm going to go ahead now and do is draw our uh, line of best fit. So just plotting my line of best fit here in purple, what we're going to see is that actually the line does not go through the origin, which is what we were expecting is told to us in the question that that's not the case. So um, yeah, let's take a look at the marks now for this question. There was a total of 12 marks going and the breakdown goes as follows. You got three marks for getting your table correct um, and it's important that you find those 1 over f values. So that's what we did there. Um, so including that's very important. Building on that as well, you're also going to get three marks for just making sure your graph is kind of arranged in the right way. So making sure that you include the um, axes, making sure that they're labeled, that you include your units and that you also have kind of like the gaps between the values on these axes to be um, the same. Moving on from that, you've got three more marks for plotting the points correctly, which in this case, um, as we can see here by the line of best fit, we've done a pretty good job. And then on top of that, we're also going to get another three marks for getting your line of best fit. So having a look now at part four here, we're going to be moving on to a more tricky question. In this case, we're actually going to be asked to use... Um, use our graph to calculate the speed of sound in air. So we have to use our graph to calculate the speed of sound in air. And um, that's an important thing to note here. So what we're going to be doing is breaking this down step by step and hopefully kind of explaining what's going on here. So the first thing that we're going to be doing here is actually finding the slope of our graph in the previous questions. So to do that, we're going to actually be using the slope function formula, um, which we found in your log tables in the coordinate geometry section. So we're going to write that down, and then what we're going to do is plug in two points to get our slope of the graph. So this is going to be our formula for finding the slope of a line. In this case, it's going to be m. Our slope is going to equal to y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So what we're going to do now is identify two points on our graph, um, and we're going to use them to calculate our slope here. So going back to our graph, what we're going to be doing is identifying two points this and plugging this into our formula here. So what we're going to be having is we're going to have m is going to equal to y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So let's identify two points. Um, and I'm just going to do that now. And the important thing to know here is that you don't want to pick um, points that are like theoretically correct, if that makes sense. You don't want points that you get straight from the data. What you're looking for is points along the line of best fit. That's an important distinction to make. So um, what we're going to be doing here is looking at our line, finding two points on the line, and then using that in our equation. So now that we have two points identified, the ones that I've identified here is going to be the point that we actually have the line intercepting our x-axis here. Um, that's going to be our first point up here. And then similarly, we're going to have another point just, and I'll start getting a different color, just around... Um, 
just around up here. And that's going to be our second point. This is in here. And um, these don't have to be perfect. Obviously, there's going to be a little bit of uh, scope here for getting a wrong answer because your line might be different depending on how you drew your graph. That's completely okay. You have a little bit of leeway here. And what we're going to do is just plug this into our equation. So what I've done here is plug in the information that we know. Now, an important distinction to make is that actually this value here on our y, y2, um, is actually going to be uh, in meters. So over here, I've just written it in plain little coordinate form, but this is actually in terms of centimeters. So we need to go from centimeters into meters. So that's an important thing to remember here. Um, and all I've done is plug in the rest of the information here. And um, what you do is if you plug this into your calculator, you're going to get a value for m, which is going to look a little bit like this. You're going to get um, anything in around 79.4. Uh, so that's kind of what we got here. Now you might get something closer to 80, 85 even. That's completely okay. You have a little bit of space here to kind of uh, get a slope that might be slightly different. Now that we have our slope, though, there's going to be another key observation we have to make before we actually go ahead and find our speed of sound in air. So what I've done here is draw out a kind of like a bit of a picture showing the resonance tube itself and actually the column of air, if you will, that's going to be uh, working here. And what we're going to see is actually there's going to be um, a relationship here between the length and as well as that, the frequency um, and the wavelength. And the reason we're interested in that is because the formula that we want to use at the end of this, the formula we want to use to find the speed of sound um, is going to be C is equal to F lambda, which can be found in your log table. The reason that we want to use this formula and the reason that we want to draw this little diagram and kind of go a little bit further is because what we're trying to do is we already found the slope, which is going to give us um, a component, but we need to find a little bit more. And what we're going to be doing here is we don't know what F is, but we do know what our length is at any given point. And it means if we look at this um, diagram here, right, we're going to have a resonance tube, which is going to have a length of L. And this is something that we know. Now, when we have our standing wave inside of L, um, or should I say inside of our tube, uh, the lowest point that frequency, uh, or should I say resonance can occur is actually um, according to the wave kind of diagram I've drawn here. And we can see that this is actually going to be, and I'll just, the distance between here and here is actually only going to be, uh, it's going to be a quarter of a wavelength. So it's going to be lambda over four. So it's a quarter of a wavelength. And what that means is we can actually have an equivalence here um, such that L is going to equal to lambda over four. Or if you want to just I'll write it down over here again, uh, this can be rearranged to have four uh, L is going to equal to lambda. And the reason that we want to use this is because it means we can actually go ahead and plug that into our calculator. Um, and it means that we can actually get a little bit closer to solving our question here. So as I was saying earlier, what we're looking to do is plug stuff into the formula here. C is equal to F lambda. And what we've actually already done is we've shown that um, lambda can be written as 4L. And now we have um, kind of all the information that we need to uh, solve this. Now, the first thing we're going to note here is that our slope M is going to be our length. It's going to be length over one over frequency, which is the same as just the length times the frequency, right? That's just a rearranging of the uh, division there. And that basically means that because, and if you just notice up here, we actually have frequency times length up here. And I can, just to rewrite this, just to make that a little bit more of an obvious thing, um, C in this case can be the same as four times L times F, which is exactly the same as the slope that we've already found. And this basically means that we can rearrange our formula to say C is going to equal to our slope M times um, 4. And we already know what our slope is. We came to the conclusion it was, um, was 79.4. And we're going to be multiplying that by 4 here. Plug this into your calculator, you're going to get an answer of in the round, and I'll just do it uh, kind of approximately 320, and this is going to be in meters per second. Now, you're probably going to get a different answer to me here. You might get something a little bit closer to um, the classical value that's expected in the perfect scenario, which is going to be 340 meters per second. But having a bit of scope here is completely fine. It just is depending on how you drew your graph. So yeah, there was a lot going on in this question, and surprisingly, there's only six marks going. And the six marks were actually being broken down between your formula that you got for doing the slope of the line. So just you got three marks for doing that formula, and then you got another three marks for getting your correct answer into here at the end. Now, if you got anything close to 340, that's perfect. You're dead on. If you got something a little bit less, or a little bit more, um, that's also okay. It's mostly the process and understanding what's happening. And finally, we move on to the last question here, which is going to be part five. And in part five, we're going to be asked to find, or should I say to explain, why the line of best fit actually doesn't go through the origin. So that's kind of an explanation behind um, that little note that they gave us earlier on. In this case, the reason that actually the graph um, does not go through the origin is because there needs to be a correction term added. Um, and this is because the wave actually does exist above the opening 
of the pipe, which is a little bit difficult to kind of wrap your head around. But um, you might see sometimes in um, examples that you'll do, you'll see that there's actually um, an error term added on. So, for example, 0.3D would be like this error term. It would be added on um, and that would kind of account for this little bit of a... Um, of the fact that the wave exists above the opening of the pipe. But either way, the reason that we're actually having that, uh, the reason that it's not going through the, the origin is because it is a correction um, that needs to be added on. Um, and that would kind of fix that problem. But because we weren't, uh, we didn't have that in the first place, it means that, um, you know, it didn't go through the origin. And yeah, for getting this correct at the end, you're going to get a total of four marks.